This is JND, the host of a channel that talks about Halloween quite regularly. I realized I haven't put a video up in over a month. But I decided I'd do something that's pretty unique to the horror genre. You don't really have people an analyzing characters, and I thought I'd do one with Dr. Loomis from the Halloween series. And I'm joined by my special guest, Stallion. Hello. So we're going to start off by talking about the original Halloween from 1978, directed by the most overrated director of all time, John Carpenter. <laughs> Literally. Um, so the film introduces Loomis as Michael's psychiatrist that he's mm -hmm. had for years. Yeah. And then he's kind of the B-plot, because it's mainly about Laurie, uh -huh. going around and trying to make sure that Michael doesn't kill anybody or he stops before he can kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've seen Nightmare on Elm Street. You've seen Friday the 13th. You notice that in most of those series... When there's a killer, there's not really a person that knows them. And you, you know that like most characters are running away. They're trying to keep themselves safe. And he just completely selflessly goes to Haddonfield mm -hmm. where Michael could kill him, could attack him, could do anything to him. He just doesn't care. He's too, he's so concerned about trying to save other people. He's, he's putting his life in danger. Mm -hmm. It's very sacrificial in a way. Mm -hmm. Now... In the first scene of the movie that he's in, that he appears in, I don't know if you noticed this, but you remember how after he talks to um, the nurse, you know, Marion, um, he leaves the car, and then after he's like, you know, look up at the gate, that's when Michael jumps on top of the car and attacks Marion. Now, this is something the sequels would later establish, but you 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 start to think in retrospect, did Michael wait for Loomis to leave because he didn't want to? attack him mm -hmm. he was going after Lori. well he was going after the nurse in that particular case to get her car and yeah. then he would go after Lori during the rest of the film one of the other parts of the first film i thought was really interesting was that so his character is named after sam loomis from psycho mm -hmm. which stars jamie lee curtis's mother and a lot of people actually have this theory that he's the same sam loomis from that movie which makes no sense. Yeah, it's a, whole different it's a completely different universe. Yeah. But it was it's kind of interesting because a lot of people hold up Halloween as this influential, never before seen type of slasher movie, and then you can see the influences on it from other stuff. Now you know the most famous part re regarding Loomis in the original film is that speech he gives the sheriff when they go into the Myers house. Uh -huh. I met him fifteen years ago. You you know the thing. Yeah. And what's really interesting about that speech is that, because it's supposed to play off the idea that Michael's scary, pure evil, Loomis known for a long time, but the part where he says, I spent eight years trying to reach him and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I knew what was behind those eyes was simply evil. So he had, it took him eight years to just completely say there's no point of return for him, mm -hmm. he's crazy, we just nothing good and this is interesting also because you remember i showed you the scenes from the tv version where they had to yeah. they were filming halloween 2 and they came and filmed extra scenes to make it longer for tv uh -huh. and they have the one scene where loomis goes into michael's room and he's staring against the wall uh -huh. he's like you fooled them. you think you, you, you fooled them haven't you michael but not me it's like you wonder if that's around the time when he starts to kind of just stop even trying to think he's actually someone who can be redeemed. And you know, the, the, the other thing is that, again, just showing how Halloween is different from a lot of its imitators, you look at the original Friday the 13th, you got Alice, right, your, that's your main character, and then the killer that we don't see the face of, but we know is out there, and we later find out who she is. Um, you look at Nightmare on Elm Street, where it's Nancy, and then you got the killer. Mm-hmm. The original Halloween is very clearly about Lori. Like yeah. it, you spend the most time with her of any character, mm -hmm. but you have this this B plot with Loomis where he's trying to find Michael, and sometimes he's like very close to him and doesn't even realize. It. Like yeah. when he when he goes to talk but, to Bracket, yeah, and Michael is driving the car. Yeah, drives right behind him. Uh huh. And he did not notice at all because he he was turned around the other way. Mm -hmm. It makes you start to wonder if Michael even saw Loomis at all. Yeah, because he was paying attention on driving instead mm -hmm. of looking at him. But I was just saying that that's another thing that makes Loomis's role in the film very different from a lot of other slasher series where 
if, if there's a main character, it's usually just the girl that's being stalked versus, you know, not this man who is the one that's going after the killer, who's mm-hmm. like pursuing him, you know, of, of his own volition. Mm-hmm. Um, to get into some, some very interesting stuff, we've talked about, not in this, but in our private discussions, foreshadowing, right? You know, where they kind of allude to something. So Loomis is like very clearly set up as someone who understands Michael on a level that most people don't mm-hmm. and kind of is like prepared for him in a way, which is why, because you have some people who don't like the ending of the movie because they think, oh, Laurie somehow looks weak because she has to be saved by Loomis. But if you think about it, Loomis being there and being the one to take down Michael only is allowed to happen because she is able to restrain and stop him for as long as she does before he finally knows where he is. Uh And also, it doesn't feel cheap because the movie set Loomis up since it started. You've been tracking his journey of trying to find him just as long as you've been tracking Michael's journey of stalking Lori and her friends. And you know the the crazy part, and we're going to get into some of the production notes in a moment here, but what I think is really interesting is that you probably spend more time with... um, Annie, you know, Lori's friend, and you do with mm-hmm. Loomis, and it's as if every time you're not with Lori or someone that she knows, you're with Loomis. Like, it just cuts back, and that's why I always hate it that people, like, a lot of people say, oh, Halloween is the story of Michael Myers, but it's like, okay, if it's his story, why do these other characters in multiple movies, mind you, have more screen time than him? You know, if it's his story, wouldn't we just be seeing everything from his perspective? Mm-hmm. Because if you think about, if you remember, the only scenes we get where we are actually seeing from his odd point of view is the opening scene when he kills his sister. And that's pretty much it for the rest of the movie. And then I guess you could argue when he sees Tommy at the school, but that still isn't like directly from his point of view. Yeah, I just, I I do believe Loomis's role in the original Halloween is is very underappreciated. Because people say, oh, Michael inspired Jason and the silent killer, which he did, right? Mm-hmm. And Lori's one of the best final girls ever in the archetype, which, you know, whatever. Like, they say it's her, Sydney, and then, like, the, you know, Sally from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm-hmm. But I truly believe that if, if it was just Michael stalking some girl for the entire movie and you didn't have this person that knows him better than anyone else... Mm-hmm. Who, because of his long history with him, when he talks, you feel there's some authority. This isn't somebody just met him yesterday. It really makes the film, like, even now, still stand out from a lot of other slasher movies. Because mm-hmm. think about it. Like, most of these films, the killer just met the person they're trying to get or the main character. And Michael's not trying to get Loomis. Throughout the entire... If you notice, in the original Halloween, he has two... two specific scenes where he kind of comes close to encountering Loomis or is with Loomis. It's the, when he, when he goes to attack the nurse, right. And he, he seemingly waits until after Loomis has already left. And then even when, when he gets shot by Loomis, when he's trying to put his mask on at the end, Mm -hmm. he he just stares at him. He doesn't even attack him. Yeah. And remember he attacked the boyfriend. He attacked Annie. He attacked Linda and none of these people were attacking him. So the one person that actually, attacks him first and he doesn't strike him at all he just stares at him he he let it happen Mm -hmm. and then after all those shots he disappears right but um there's something else to point out from that when 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 michael falls off the balcony right Uh and laurie says loomis was that the boogman says a matter of fact it was and he goes up to the balcony and looks over you notice his face changes first it's surprise and then it's as if he knew that that would happen. Like, he knew there was some kind of supernatural thing. Because I said before that a lot of people complained about the Halloween sequels having supernatural elements to them. Like, oh, Michael shouldn't have powers. Just be like, if you explain stuff, it ruins the mystique, all that stuff, right? But, again, thinking about this, how the hell does someone survive getting shot yeah, six, six times? times. And, and not only that, but, like, they, they fall off a balcony, which you know it hurts to land on the ground, land to, to take a fall, and then somehow they're, they're healthy enough to walk away, to, like, to, to quickly get up and move out of space. That's why I always think people are ridiculous when they say that the original Halloween is this very realistic movie that all, none of the sequels come anywhere near being as good as, because 
again, the original film, I would I would argue is pretty realistic until mm -hmm. that scene because yeah. someone can just sneak up on people, and if you notice, Michael only ever attacks when it's one person in the room. Mm -hmm. But when you get to that last scene and he gets shot off that balcony that's, and, and disappears, that is supernatural. there is no way a per regular person can do that, and that's why it's. It's so funny how people have, I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but people have this like, this idealized view of John Carpenter, the guy that wrote and directed mm -hmm. the first Halloween. Yeah. And a lot of the problems that people, these are problems people think the series has. I don't really care one way or the other, where they're talking about having an issue with Michael being supernatural, the sibling angle. All this is stuff he invented or he laid the groundwork for. Mm -hmm. That film was completely realistic up until that last scene. Yeah. But anyways, to get into some production stuff. Um... So the original Halloween had a cast of basically unknown people. It was made on a fairly cheap budget. It was filmed in three weeks. We've been over this stuff before. You're aware of it, right? And Pleasance at the time was the only big name actor that was involved with it. And he only agreed to be involved with it because his daughter liked an earlier work of Carpenter's. Um, other things that are worth noting is that he filmed all of his scenes, all of his scenes in the first Halloween, right? In five days. Mm -hmm. Less than a week. Now, you know, when people film movies, sometimes they spend months. Sometimes they spend weeks, not even a week, to film all his scenes. Mm -hmm. Also, he was the, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, the only actor who... So, the clothes that Laurie wears, that's actual stuff that Jamie Lee Curtis owned. Like, those are actual clothes. Mm -hmm. Apparently... Pleasance was the only person who, you know, like his trench coat and the suit he wore, that was all stuff that they got for him. Mm -hmm. By the way, you could have a whole discussion on symbolism with his outfit because um, Michael has like the white mask, but then he has like the dark clothes, mm -hmm. and then Loomis has, and he's evil, right? And then Loomis has like the cl the like light jacket, and he's on, you know, on the side of good to to such an ultimate extent. And that's why. When people watch this stuff, it feels like a lot of times they turn their brain off. But if you analyze Loomis from a character standpoint, he, he's like Michael's polar opposite. Mm -hmm. Like, Michael is young. He's 21 in the first movie. Loomis is old. Actually, it's kind of funny because in the original Halloween script, they say he's a man in his 40s. Mm -hmm. And Pleasance was like 59 when they filmed it. So he's like almost 20 years older yeah, than the script that they, th yeah, that, they, um, that they were envisioning. Um but but just to like point out more parallels and and distinction between them, you have Michael as this person who wants to go out and kill people for his selfish desire to just do something evil, right? And Loomis as as this selfless person who's going out and trying to save people from being murdered, even though he has no obligation to, because he's just a doctor. He's not a cop. He's not a sheriff. Mm -hmm. you, you it's it is an entirely selfless thing that he does. And it's this complete sacrifice. And that's that's one of the reasons why I think he's one of the more interesting characters in horror films. Because you don't see this type of character in those other type, other series. It's usually a group of people that are targeted by the killer. Or some woman that the killer's after. And even when you have people that are like trying to get back at the killer. Mm -hmm. Like um, you remember Tommy in Friday the 13th Part 6. Yeah. It's like... I guess you could say that's selfless, but it he still is the one that directly resulted in Jason coming back because he remember he goes to the gravesite and you know he gets shocked with the lightning and that brings him back, mm -hmm. and he still is tr only interested in going after Jason because he survived him in the fourth movie, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas as far as we know, in those fifteen years that Michael and Loomis were together, Michael never attacked Loomis. Never threatened him. You know, he was just this person that was his doctor that tried to, you know, get this kid to not be evil anymore. And it didn't work. And then he tried to stop him from doing evil things to other people. You know, it's just, it's so selfless. And it's so, and, and Pleasance's performance is, is, I would say, easily the best in the movie. You know, when he's on screen and you got this scary music playing behind me, he's talking about how Michael did this. And he, you see this dead dog. Oh, he got hungry. Like every time he's on screen, you can you can just tell how afraid he is, and it makes Michael a bigger threat because it's someone who knows him and is telling you exactly what is going to happen as this film unfolds. 
and a bunch of teens and even a sheriff because Brackett doesn't know him mm -hmm. really at all yeah. who are just completely unaware of the foreboding doom that's going to approach them very soon. So it it it's just it's he's such an interesting character and it's it's really it's really kind of funny when you think about how he's not the main character of the movie he's not the one we see the most of um but he's the one who has i'd actually argue that out of out of everyone in the first movie he's probably like i'd say he's the most well acted right like the one who's got the performance that is the most captivating like you can tell there was more thought put in because i always just see laurie as a regular teen girl and that's the appeal of her to people mm -hmm. but like I swear, I've watched other horror series, and you you just you don't have someone who is like Loomis. You, if you get something that's kind of close of like hunting the killer, it's usually someone who was attacked by them or has some kind of like inherently selfish reason to be that way. Like they've been st struck by them or gone after by them. But with um, with Loomis, it's just a person who, by complete happenstance, right, just this normal doctor, mm -hmm. he meets this screwed up kid. And he tries to the best of his ability for almost, almost a decade. Eight years is two years away from being ten years. Mm -hmm. For almost a decade to change this kid from being this evil person. And he couldn't do it. So then he's like, well, I guess I'll just cut my losses and try to keep him locked up here. And, you know, you see how he doesn't even think of Michael as a person. He refers to him as it. And is talking about putting him on so much of this, of, was it Thorazine, where he can't even, like, move or anything. You know, he completely understands how dangerous this guy is, mm -hmm. and the people around him just don't. So it's 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 really um, it's something you don't see in other series, and a big part of the appeal for that for that first movie, for me anyway, is just is seeing a character like that because I I've watched uh, you know I always give this example. By the time I saw the first Halloween, I'd seen all the Nightmare on Elm Streets. I'd seen all of the um. um films for Friday the 13th and the biggest draw for me with Halloween was that you had recurring characters like actual protagonists that you see as often as the killer as Michael depending on what timeline you're in mm -hmm. and you know I've, I've said before I don't think Michael is that interesting of a character he's a person who's evil to be evil who sometimes I guess has powers that are supernatural but he's not. I don't. I don't really see him as a character. He's just a person that is the antagonist to get the story rolling for people that actually have personalities, you know. Um, but I. I can't say that about Loomis. I. I think that he's. He could work well in pretty much any story, like any story where you've got a, a dangerous person. You can have someone like that that just, just out of out of the selflessness of their own heart wants to stop them from doing crazy evil stuff to people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. It's really sad too that Halloween kind of has this like really this refusal to never not use Michael, um, mm -hmm. because I do think if you made like if if, and we'll get into this later on, but if the ending of Hall Halloween two was really the the ending that just stopped everything and they didn't make any more movies with Michael, I think if they wanted to do more Halloween films like like horror movies that take place on Halloween night in the same mm -hmm. universe, yeah. they could have kept Loomis as like the main guy. And just had him going after different crazy people, and it would it would have completely worked. You've had a good actor who who like who enjoyed playing that character, mm -hmm. and who the directors respected. I think it, it really could have been good. Um, now going into Halloween too, which you know came about because the first Halloween, despite being made on a shoestring budget, <laughs> ended up being this really big successful movie. Um, you've had Carpenter come out and call the film an abomination. Remember, this is the guy that wrote the movie. And I thought he was insane. And that's why I've never... Because you understand that I, with most series, especially horror movie series, the first movie is the most acclaimed one almost every time. The only time you see an exception is Friday the 13th. Yep. Outside of that, every every series, people say, the first one's the best, first one's the best. This is the case with Halloween, with Scream, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Child's Play, etc., etc., Yep. Which I think isn't, you know, just, it, it's, that's why I don't really take that view seriously because it seems like something people say by default versus actually explaining and articulating why is this first movie so good to where you believe none of the other ones are good. And I'm sorry, but I think Halloween 2 is just as good, if not better, than the first one. We've been over this before. We've had this conversation. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that it does that the first one didn't is it gives Loomis more screen time. Um, he's actually 
the character who, who first appears in like new footage as far as like stuff that doesn't just recount the first movie because you know the second movie opens with a recap of the first film where you know he had, he shoots Michael off the balcony and you remember it's a different they they shot it again where you know you see him just surprised and then he comes out uh, call the police tell him I shot him six times is this some kind of joke I've been trick or treat to death tonight all night you don't know what death is you know. Mm-hmm. A scene like that works because it shows you his immediate thought. Because you understand, if Michael was locked up year after year, we can infer he probably didn't attack anybody. We can mm-hmm. infer he probably wasn't violent. So this is his first time really seeing what Michael has done as far as like as an adult. And now he knows there you're going to need to do something that's more than just bullets to take out someone like this. Um, one of the first scenes in the film, and you know what's crazy is that Charles Cyphers, that's, that's the actor who portrayed uh, Brackett, right? Mm-hmm. He, he receives third billing in the movie, and you know what, what third billing is. Um, you know, like the third person to show up in the credits. Mm-hmm. He's only in the movie for like 10 minutes. Because remember, he disappears after they find Annie's body. But what's interesting is that in that, in, when he's ta- in, the, in his scene... Scenes with Loomis, uh, he dismisses the idea that he shot him six times. He thinks he missed him. So I'm supposed to believe Michael just pretended to get shot and just threw himself off a fucking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you have a favorite scene from Halloween Two with Loomis or? When he when um when they when he was like on the floor in the hospital. Yeah, and it looked like he was dead, and then uh-huh. he gets a second win. But do you, do you have anything in particular with, with regard to Halloween 2 about Loomis that you like? Like any scene in the movie besides that one that like stuck out to you? Yeah, when he shot both of his eyes so he couldn't see. That was Lori. Oh. Remember he gives her the gun? And yeah, then... gives her the gun and shoots both of her, her eyes. Well, do you him. remember the scene when they go to the school the schoolhouse? Yeah. And he's like Sam Hain, Lord of the Dead? Mm-hmm. So we have mentioned before that he died while they were making the sixth movie, right? Daniel Farrens, the writer of the sixth film, wanted to tie everything together by going back to this idea of, you know, Halloween as this, you know, this uh, holiday that was used for these festivals and just kind of like the, the the history of Halloween, right? Um, and that's why a lot of people who talk about, because I don't like calling 4, 5, and 6 the Thorn trilogy because they're really not a trilogy. They're three movies made by different writers and directors with the same characters in them. Um, but a lot of people say that that's what starts the supernatural stuff in the series and all the rest of that. But Halloween 2's, Halloween 2's narrative is pretty much Loomis and Michael. It's like, yeah, Lori's in there, but not as much. You know, you get some scenes where at the hospital, but she's more of a plot device, which I think is the movie's biggest flaw. But at the same time, it's like, if you set the film right after the first one, there's only so much she can do, you know, because you have her in an injured state from her encounter with him in the last movie. Um... And it's just it's so it's so interesting how in the second film you have you kind of have some similar notions. You have Loomis giving his speeches again, mm-hmm. which he has to because now he's paired with an, another deputy with Hunt. That's the one that is with them after Brackett mm-hmm. gives up. By the way, Brackett is so ridiculous. He actually tries to say that Loomis let Michael out. That he like when they're in the car, he says Loomis was the one that let him out, which mm-hmm. you know is completely ridiculous. And then he says that it's Loomis's fault that his daughter died, even though he's the only person from Smith's Grove that was trying to stop any of this from happening. Yeah. If Loomis didn't show up, uh, indisputably, Michael would have killed more people. Lori mm-hmm. definitely wouldn't have lived because no one was there to assist her besides him. Mm-hmm. You know, Brackett had a gun, but he wasn't around. So when you get over to, um, to Halloween 2, one of my favorite things... Um, with reference to his character is the scene where he finds out about Lori and Michael being brother and sister Mm -hmm. because you got to understand that even though he's hit Michael's psychiatrist knows him better than anybody else he doesn't he doesn't think Michael has a motive like he killed his sister and then seemingly killed nobody else right until he was an adult and even then it's like okay they're just the random people that live in his town right so he come he comes to Haddonfield to kill but when he finds out about the sibling angle, right? Now he knows, oh, this is his, you know, the modus operandi is, right? It's mm-hmm. someone's thing that they do 
specific pattern of cr- of criminality, right? Like, oh, every time somebody breaks into a house, they always, I don't know, eat some candy, you know, stuff like that. Right. Um, so he now knows, yeah, he's the person that goes after his family members. And you got to, like, you have um, Marion mentioning that, the, you know, they locked up the records, they sealed it after he was a kid. And it's really crazy because you have to think to yourself, they didn't even trust his doctor with this stuff, the person that was with him more than anybody else. But in the same scene, you have him pull the gun on the on the on the deputy, the state trooper, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's like you know, turn this car around now, and he doesn't want to do it. And you know what? What really gets me is that a lot of people like they criticize his portrayal in Halloween Five as being like out of character and he's mean and all. And it's, but my thing with Loomis, especially the, you know the version from one to six, is that he's doing anything and everything to stop a greater threat. Mm-hmm. So. Him pulling a gun on a cop, I can completely believe in if he thinks the cop is stopping him from stopping Michael. You know, like the thing the thing that people don't understand about this character, in my opinion, is that he will do everything possible to to bring down what he believes is the ultimate evil, the pure evil, which is Michael, right? So maybe because we know what happens to the, the the deputy when they get to the, to the hospital, he gets his throat slashed by Michael. But let's say the deputy lived and he wanted to press charges on Loomis. Loomis wouldn't have a problem with that because he killed Michael, right? He stopped him permanently. So he will now face the consequences that come with doing this thing that nobody else was able to do. You know, mm-hmm. we, you know the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, and that's another thing I think is really interesting that he he's, he's still paired with law enforcement and given the speeches. And if you notice, Halloween 2's plot is a kind of similar to the first one, a little bit in the sense that Loomis sees Michael at the start of the movie, right? One scene at the start of the movie, and then he doesn't see him until all the way at the end. And you have some people who criticize the film, and they say, oh, they had to do that because Loomis would stop Michael really quickly, and you know, then the movie would only be like 10 minutes. Like, well, that's kind of a cynical view to take because, you know, if Loomis isn't in the movie, or like if, he, if we're not with him, right? Because we can't be with Lord because she's at the hospital. Because Loomis is w- involved in Haddonfield Police's efforts to stop Michael, right? Mm-hmm. We find out who the the lookalike is, Ben Tramer. That's the guy that was mentioned in the first movie. And then, you know, the cop runs into him and blows him up. We find out about the sibling angle. We find out um, about him vandalizing the school. You know, all of these things add to Michael's character, and we don't, we wouldn't be able to get them if we weren't with Loomis. So it's 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 such a bizarre um, a position that people take with him, where they just kind of they just try to sell him short. As far as oh, you're you know they they could have done this because with Lori, you don't you're not going to be able to get her just having these because she's injured. You're not going to be able to see her running around and trying to figure out you know th- why is this person my brother? And, th- th- and if you remember. She never actually finds out in Halloween 2 that Michael's yeah. her brother. Because mm-hmm. her and Loomis don't speak to each other for more than like a few words when they're running. Um, but just to kind of go into some more things that are specific to the film. Do, do you remember the first scene where he's talking to the, you know, I mentioned it earlier. The, you don't know what death is. Remember I told you that's the guy that would direct Halloween 3, Tommy Lee Wallace? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, it was a nice little cameo for him. But also... I always rem- remember the imagery of Loomis holding Michael's blood in his hand with like when he gets up because if you remember the first Halloween is pretty tame like it doesn't really have blood it's just kind of if someone gets stabbed you can't really see up close um really the only instances you see of blood are like when Michael kills you know Judith at the start and then when Lori gets slashed in the shoulder and then when you kind of get over to the second half of the film and really the whole hospital sequence is iconic and memorable and distinct like it's you know and i always say like it's there's something about a movie where because i'll say that the the ending is my favorite part like that final 10 minutes or so but the rest of the film sets that up loomis wouldn't go to the hospital if he didn't know that laurie was michael's sister because up to that point he thinks she's just a random girl that michael happened to target while he came back to his hometown so I, I just I always hate that people try to sell the rest of the film short because it really does set up that conclusion. 
Um, and Lori, you know, because she's still injured, she can't really get away from the hospital because, she, you know, her foot is bad from the, um, the injuries she, she sustained. Um, when you get over to the latter part of the film and you have Loomis shoot Michael right when he's like, when he's coming through the glass, if you notice, he shoots him, because in, apparently in those types of guns, they have six bullets. He shoots him enough times to where when you get the later scene where he like points the gun at his head and is about to shoot after he comes in the room, that's why he's out of bullets because he used up all of like in an act in real life. That's the same number of bullets you could hold at maximum in a gun, five or six. So oh, now I remember he uses one bullet to threaten the um, the deputy. You know, he fires it, mm -hmm. and then the other five go into Michael, and then he doesn't have any. Which at that point he wouldn't even notice because he's too busy running from after he slashes. Mm -hmm. And you know it's funny because um, I pointed this out, but when he kills the sheriff, not the sheriff, I keep forgetting um, so many officers, you know, in these films, the uh, state trooper, right, the one he slashed the throat up. That's the only time in, in all of these movies where Loomis actually sees Michael kill someone. Mm -hmm. That's why when he he's like. Because he warned him, he said, hey, stay away from him, stay away. He's dead. He's no, dead. He no, he ain't. No, he yeah. Ain't. Remember, that's why I said he's he's the most authorized when it comes to knowing Michael's pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of the final sequence? Like, just what are your thoughts on it? Mm, it was good. Right, but does it was it exciting? Yeah. Heart racing? Mm -hmm. You notice that Kind of like the first one, you only get the main three characters, Loomis, Lori, and Michael, together mm -hmm. all the way at the end. And it's and you notice that after the sheriff get the the deputy, that's just gonna, we're gonna have like a little counter where every time I accidentally yeah. say it, it just goes off. Mm -hmm. Every time the deputy, every when the deputy stroke gets slashed, Lori immediately latches on the look like she grabs his jacket in fear because remember he turns to her and he says, "I'm sorry, I left you. Are you all right?" And she doesn't even respond because she's too busy staring at Michael and trying to figure out why he won't die. And she says this out loud. And then when she sees Michael kill this officer, she just grabs on Loomis's jacket and then leads him out the room. Mm -hmm. It's time to go. Yeah. But it's just, it's interesting because like in those first two films, and this is something the remakes also like don't really address. And I mentioned before that one of the reasons I'm a little, I'm, I'm fond of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 is because it's the only movie where we see Laurie's reaction to finding out she's Michael's sister like in, the, in all of these films the only one she either knows at the start or finds out before you know or after or something like that um if you notice between Halloween and Halloween 2 Loomis and Lori barely say anything to each other at all mm -hmm. they're comp like the whole first movie they, they have no scenes together until that last must be two minutes when, when Loomis comes up the stairs, right, and shoots Michael, and then, you know, the, was that the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. And then in the second film, even though they're running together, they still aren't, you know, like, speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the thing I thought was really interesting about the finale is that it gives them both a very important role in stopping Michael, right? Because even though Loomis is the one that, you know, makes a sacrifice... He still couldn't, be, wouldn't have been able to do that if Lori didn't shoot out Michael's eyes, because that's what causes Michael to start swinging around, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where she is, and be susceptible to being fooled like that. And Loomis uses some trickery, right? Because he's disguised his voice, yeah. "Get out here now!" You know, just like tricks him into thinking that she's still in the room. You know, make, make while like also warning her to leave because he's about to do this thing that's going to take him out. And really, before I saw the film, I had no idea how they were going to stop Michael. He'd been shot. Stabbed, you know, it just seemed completely invincible, right? Uh -huh. um, and you know, a lot of hospitals do have those valves with just all that loose air. Yeah. Um, and sure enough, when he gets when when Michael stabs him, if you notice, because we're gonna we're gonna have this discussion later on when you get into four and five, he you saw you see him Michael kill people throughout the first and second movie, and you know he always finishes them off, strangles them, um, you know, with the one lady stuck the screwdriver in the side of her head, put the hammer to the one guy. With Loomis, he, he lightly, and we're not going to pretend this isn't some injury, he, he stabs him, but it's in a place where it's not fatal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kill him. All it really does is kind of like knock the wind out of him. <laughs> he just falls to the ground. Mm -hmm. 
and is like passed out for two seconds. And while, gets back up. Yeah. And it goes back to this thing of, you know, you kind of start to question yourself because we were we mentioned before that he only attacks if you notice, he sees Loomis during the first movie at the end, and he sees Loomis before that when Loomis shoots him over and over, right? And then he only attacks him when Loomis puts a gun to his head. So you start to wonder if he wasn't trying to strike him or blast him or hit him, maybe Michael wouldn't have attacked him. Mm -hmm. But to get to into the ending of the film with this explosion, um, you know, it's like a cool set piece, right? Remember we said earlier about like part of Loomis's charm is the sacrificial nature of his character that he goes out and does this thing that nobody asks him to do that he's not obligated to do and how he when he goes out and like is risking his life it's something that really doesn't get touched on by any other character like no one comments on this fact right in the films but like because he does that it's totally believable that he would just destroy himself if it meant getting rid of the ultimate evil because he truly believes there's no one like michael this is pure evil you know, and it's it's also coupled with supernatural abilities. You know, when he's talking about, you know, he wasn't even remotely human, you know, just he's convinced this type of person is so unique in all the worst ways that they're that it's worth giving my life up to stop them. Mm -hmm. And I and, you know, we've talked we have a fondness for Halloween for we've been over this before. But I think and you'll probably agree with this, right? Halloween two has the most conclusive ending, you know, like as far as making you truly believe this is it, there's mm -hmm. going to be no more after that. Remember, that movie ends with Loomis and Michael dead. And you don't even get to see Loomis. You just know he's been exploded from the from the explosion. Um, and really, that whole ending sequence is so disturbing. Just So Loomis, gets, Loomis blows himself up along with Michael, and then Michael, while being, being on fire from the explosion, walks out the room. And then falls. Yeah, just collapses right in the middle. Like, even when he's on fire... His number one goal is to get his sister and make sure he kills her. Like, he doesn't even care about his own health. Got near her, but then fell. Yeah. And remember, if he if he's on fire and he's got he, he's still blind, right? He doesn't even know where she is. He's mm -hmm. still, like, just like, I guess she's not in this room. <laughs> you know, like, if you, the more you think about it, right, the more it just shows you how evil he is, right? Um, It's, you know, Halloween 2 is just, it's such a... And I, you know, you have you've had Halloween 2018 come along and say ignore all the movies except for the first one, but that's why I don't like the 2018 timeline that much because it turns Loomis into a one movie character who was just around for like the first run and then that's it. Um, and I just I just think Halloween two works so much better with the first film. You know, it takes place on the same night. Michael's killing spree. Remember, in the first movie only kills like what four people on, on that night. They got to get his clothes and the three teenagers. Second movie adds another, like, what, 10 people onto that? Just a complete bloodbath, you know? And, you know, when you look at 4 and 5 and 6 and, like, all the, the, the films that are set in the same timeline, right? It's so much easier to believe in him as a threat when he's killed 10, 10 or so people in one night. Because, with all, like, with real-life murderers, they might get a few people a year, a few people every couple of years. 10 people in one night, over 10 people in one night. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that make it to where every time they talk about how scary he is in four, five, and six, you're like, yeah, I can, I can buy that this would shock and traumatize people from from then on. Anything else you want to say about Halloween too? Mm -mm. If we're gonna get into the production notes, we should point out that Pleasance was nominated for an award for his role in the movie, and he mm -hmm. lost out to Harrison Ford. Which, I don't, if I'm think, if I'm getting this correctly, that was the only time any actor in the series. Other than maybe Jamie Lee Curtis got nominated for their performance, mm -hmm. which is especially sad because we've been over Daniel Harris and the good work she did in four and five, you know, mm -hmm. to where even people that don't like five admit she did a, a great job as this, you know, traumatized little girl. Um, I noticed Halloween 2 doesn't get anywhere near as talked about as, um, as, as four and even five do. And a lot of it, and especially the first one, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's kind of just the film that's meant to cap everything off, you know, when it was originally made. Mm -hmm. But I, I still, I think it's one of the top tier horror sequels. Like out of any of the movies in these series that aren't the first one, it's pretty high up there. Like you have people who don't even like any of the films past the first one who admit the second one's one of the better ones. 
Um, which I still think it's crazy to not like the second one, but then like the first one. It's like, oh no, the second one has more gore. It's like, I thought people liked that. <laughs> um, so getting into four. Now, what's really interesting about four, just on the production level, right, is that it was written in 11 days. They approached Jamie Lee Curtis to come back. She didn't want to do it because, you know, she thought she was this big hot shot. And you saw a fish called Wanda, so you know what she was doing at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Pleasance was the only person to come back from the first two movies. You know, Michael was always played by a different person, but he was the only individual, whether it's writer, actor, that to come back from the original two. And that's a pretty significant thing because, you know, we were having this conversation a few days ago and even, you know, yesterday. You look at these other series, right? It's like, oh, look, um, Child's Play. You got, you know, Chucky in every movie. Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy in every movie. You know, but you don't really get, outside of maybe Scream, protagonists that show up for more than, like, two movies. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a really big... And this is before, like, any of those other series got around to doing that type of stuff. It's always the killer that just comes back over and over, you know? Um, but just kind of going through a little bit more stuff, I should mention that he was um, given this face makeup, right? To, make, to, to have burns on the side of his face. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple of scenes where the makeup looks different because at one point his girlfriend, or I guess who later became his wife, said that it looked like he had an egg on his face. <laughs> and they changed the way the, the makeup looked because of that. Um, but look, Halloween 4 has some interesting stuff for him. Like It shows that he was still working as Michael's doctor. And you, and you remember the doctor that he argues with the star of the film, who was there when Michael's getting transferred. And he, you know, he, Loomis shows up and is like, why wasn't I notified? He admits that Loomis, that he wants Loomis to when Mike, when Michael is transferred to retire or die. <laughs> you know he hates him so much, and he even says to Loomis's face, I, you know, I think you're the one who needs mental help. And it, and it goes back to this same theme, right? Where the only person who knows how dangerous Michael is is Loomis, and is written off for knowing the truth. So this is where we we're introduced to your your favorite character, right, mm-hmm. Jamie? Now we've talked about what parallels and foils are, right? Characters yeah. that are like totally opposite from each other, mm-hmm. and you notice how her and Loomis are like completely the reverse of each other. Where like Loomis is this old man who's not related to Michael, but is very you know knows him better than anybody else, right? Mm-hmm. Where Jamie is this little girl who is related to Michael, but has never met him before the movie takes place. Um, and the narrative just, of the, hmm? she just knows that that's his, her uncle. Yeah. And you said before Halloween Four is your favorite film in the series, right? Mm-hmm. And a big part of that is because of Jamie and Loomis as well, Jamie, right? Yeah. Because I I think there and if you notice, um, Jamie is very different from Lori. We've been over this before, where Lori was a teenager, Jamie's a little girl. Lori can take care of herself. Jamie needs people to take care of her, etc. And if you notice as well, her interactions with Loomis are very different. Because remember, Lori only sees Loomis at the end of the first and second movie, right? Whereas Jamie first sees Loomis when he's out looking for her with Meeker. And then she also sees him after, you know, the whole house gets killed and Rachel looks like she's dead when she, you know, falls on the floor and passes out. But um, you have a lot of people who say that Loomis is a static character, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's been ten years, and he's still trying to chase after Michael. And I even I even read one article where a guy said he turned into a self parody by still like warning people about Michael. It's like, well, I mean, isn't that kind of the thing with horror series where when a character shows up again, they kind of do the same thing? I mean, you know, you look at Michael in the first movie, kills people. Second movie, he kills people. Fourth movie, kills people. Yeah. So wouldn't it kind of make sense that Loomis would still be doing the same thing if yeah. Michael's doing the same thing? Um, and I, I do think Jamie adds an interesting twist because, you know, remember Loomis goes to Haddonfield and he doesn't know what Michael's after. Mm-hmm. In four, he knows Michael is after J- Jamie. Yeah. And also, did you notice that he never actually says her name in the whole movie? Mm-hmm. He says that little girl is in danger. You know, um, I just thought that was like an interesting thing that he doesn't. He said like he mentions Lori. And says, like, you know, 10 years ago, he tried to kill Laurie Strode, but he doesn't actually say Jamie's name. 
mm-hmm. until the fifth film. Um, would, would would you say you have a favorite scene with Loomis in Halloween Four? Mm. I think there's one you remember, Michael. Mm-hmm. When they're at the yeah the gas station, and he turns around to him. Mm-hmm. You know, my favorite part of that scene is him um, saying, "Don't you know? Don't go to Haddonfield if if you want another victim, take me." Mm-hmm. And it goes back to that selfless thing because who who like you've seen all these movies? Who in any of them? Offers himself as a sacrifice to Michael, mm-hmm. like who, who, like you've seen, you've seen every film between the first one and Kills. Name another character who just says, "Michael, hey, you know what? Don't kill all these people. Just take me. Here, here I am." No He's the only one. You know, one thing I thought was really um, interesting is that when he goes to Meeker, and he's like, you know, Michael is here to get people again Meeker points out like says you know what brings you back to Haddonfield after 10 years so which means that after Halloween 2 Loomis never came back to Haddonfield and it was I one of the things I really wish the film addressed a little bit more is like what happened in those 10 years like did he keep in touch with Laurie because in the H2O comics which don't have to do with the um with one through six but are set you know in in the H2O timeline it's it is known that Laurie and Loomis kept in touch and still spoke to each other after Halloween too, mm-hmm. and we never know like if she just forgot about him, if he forgot about her. It's never really revealed or or discussed or talked about at all. Um, but if you notice, his relationship with Meeker is different from Bracket because Meeker at first doesn't believe him, and then Loomis goes six bodies, a filling station in flames. I'm telling you, Michael Myers is in this town. And, you know, he, he gives this impassioned plea, right, about all these dead bodies he's seen. Mm-hmm. And then Meeker quickly starts to work with them, right? And you remember the scene when they go back to the to the, the sheriff's station and they find all those cops laying on the ground covered in blood. Mm-hmm. And Meeker's so horrified that he grabs Loomis by the jugs like, what, what are we dealing with? And then Meeker gets mad that Loomis tells the town about the... Um, the stuff Michael's doing, you know, like he doesn't want to tell them what, what they're up against. Mm-hmm. By the way, out of the original film series, so the you know one, two, four, five, and six, four is the only one where Loomis doesn't go to the Myers house. Like the only one where he doesn't just show up at Michael's house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another one of my favorite parts with him is the. Um, when, when he's when he's going to the, and this is a scene that people don't talk about enough. Now you remember when those teenagers come up to him after his car gets destroyed, mm-hmm. and they blow that smoke in his face after, yeah. which is really nasty because it's like you you just see this old guy walking down the street that needs a ride, and you know if you don't want to pick him up, whatever. But why do you have to? It just shows you how like nasty people can be just randomly, you know, to others. Mm-hmm. Um, but he gets in the car with this 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 guy right and you're you know what i'm talking about mm-hmm. and when they're in this car uh sayer is his name he's he mentions you know uh you're, you're hunting it aren't you and then loomis is like what are you what are you hunting it's like you know uh evil the end of the world it's always got a name and in this scene he like and this is very significant because one this guy's only in one scene and he's nicer to loomis than damn near any other character in all these movies mm-hmm. if you notice like he doesn't he offers him a ride. He offers him a drink, shakes his hand, mm-hmm. and you really you don't have anyone else that's like that. Now, do you remember when during the scene where they're going to the schoolhouse, um, Loomis hugs Jamie after they go inside, right, mm-hmm. and then gets thrown through the glass by by Super Saiyan Michael? Yeah. Now, the reason that Michael looks that way is because. They were filming this scene late at night because, you know, when they do a movie in, at yeah, the night, they um, grab they, the wrong mask yeah, and everyone was too mask. tired to go and grab another one and film the whole thing again. I was like, wow, that's a pretty big error to have in your film because that's the only scene where he's wearing a different mask in the movie. Mm-hmm. Like the and only it's different colors, so it stands out. Right. But you know that that's a thing that some of the other films have, too. Like in mm-hmm. remember I told you in H2O. 
First, he wears the super the um, the, the the mask from the sixth film, then another one, and then a third one, mm-hmm. like three different masks in one movie. It was really weird. To kind of go over some more stuff, and I was really hoping you would kind of assist me with this because I, you know, since four is, I, I think four is just easier to talk about than two because yeah. of all the other characters. Mm-hmm. Did you do you notice that? When he goes up to Jamie when she's out, he's like, "What are you doing out here all alone?" Yeah. Uh-huh. That she she's never spoken to him before, and she instantly trusts him, mm-hmm. believes Which him. Which is weird because how would you trust a man that you already just met? Yeah, well, then that opens the theory. If you know, did Lori tell Jamie, Jamie about, about Loomis? Loomis? Yeah. Because remember, we don't we don't know anything, and this is unfortunately part of the problem when you have films that are with horror movies where like they don't really talk about the characters and flush them out as much as you would like Mm -hmm. so you remember that jamie is like um what eight nine ten in in four Mm -hmm. so she's old enough to where her mother's only been dead for a year and she knows who michael is right so Mm -hmm. wouldn't wouldn't laurie mention to jamie hey uh by the way michael had this doctor that is still around and is like actively trying to make sure he doesn't do what he did that night again You know, one would think, right? Mm-hmm. No, that's something I wish that, because um, sometimes the screenwriters for these for these films come out and they say something. So, like, um, you know, you'll have someone who says, uh, "I'll give you an example." The director of Halloween Four did an interview, Dwight Little, mm-hmm. where he said that Mike, that in his opinion, Michael wants to connect with Jamie, like have a relationship with her, but he's he his mind is too messed up to really understand how to bond with her so that's why he doesn't even he's he's not able to do it so i wish that mcelroy that's the guy that wrote the film that he would come out and say yeah laurie told jamie about loomis and that's why you know she's able she's trust him but also you gotta think to yourself everybody else as far as she's she knows is dead so Mm -hmm. and she saw loomis earlier so she clearly knows he's like peripherally on her side so maybe that's the reason, you know, you're the only other person that isn't deceased. <laughs> that's why I'm, that's why I trust you over, um, you know, as to, to the extent that I do, even though we just met. Mm-hmm. That could be one theory. Do, do you remember, and of course you can't forget the, the conclusion before we talk about the ending. Do, do, do you remember that with, when Halloween 5 starts, you have this, it's a recap of Michael's defeat in the fourth movie where he gets shot and, you know, blown up with the dynamite. Mm-hmm. Now, in 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 the scene in that when it's done again in four in, in five, excuse me, you see a, you get like a quick flash of Loomis holding Jamie, right? Yeah. But you also notice that that scene isn't actually in Halloween Four. Mm-hmm. After Loomis gets thrown through the glass by Blonde Michael, he vanishes from the film. Until after Michael is defeated, which actually, if you think about it, four and um, six are like the only ones where he's not involved with taking out Michael in the climax. If you, if you notice that, mm-hmm. but I was just pointing out that I was always intrigued. I was like, wow, they that they they really added that scene. Was that something that they had left over? Because sometimes they do use stuff that's left over. We were talking about this yeah. before. Um, with Spider-Man Three, when you get the like flashback of Harry mm-hmm. cradling Norman's body, yeah, that's from that's a delete. That's a scene that didn't make it into the first movie that they stuck in there later on in the third one. Um, but just what I, I I just find so interesting about the film is that you have this version of Loomis who's like he's got he now walks with a cane. He has the scars over the side of his face. He's, he has, he wears these gloves to cover the scars. And it, I, I point it out because you look at H2O and Lori, and this is something in 2018 as well, the, the scars she has on her shoulder from when Michael cuts her is still there. So in a way, Loomis is kind of like the first protagonist in the series where they have like a physical injury from, you know, like one of the movies that just stays with them. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was interesting because like they, they do that with Lori later on after Jamie Lee Curtis finally came back from her extended vacation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. So tell me what happens in the ending of Halloween Four. Just describe it to me. Like when they get back to the house, yeah. Or basically, Jamie like gets basically corrupted 
stabs her stepmom, come like is on top of the stairs. Loomis freaks out. The other sheriff comes, holds the gun. Meeker. Yeah, Meeker holds the gun and sees Jamie with the scissors and the clown mask on with the with the clown costume. Now you understand that it was Halloween Five that revealed that Jamie was possessed, right? Yeah. So as far as we know. For whatever reason, and when Jamie gets back to the house, she stabs her stepmother, Mm -hmm. and then Loomis sees this and screams and alerts the others to it as well. Um, You have a lot of people who say this is, like, one of the most iconic endings in any of the films in the series. Mm -hmm. And even though, like, yeah, the imagery is shocking, because remember, it's made to look like Michael is in the house. And remember, when you saw the film for the first time, you thought... That was Michael. Yeah, and, we, you know, I I remember your reaction. I I remember that. It was... It was... It was a... it was very iconic, and I, I knew they'd have the cameras rolling because we, we knew what was coming up. But I think a lot of the shock of that conclusion is is bolstered by Loomis's reaction. The, mm-hmm. no! Because remember, he's the person that's known Michael the longest, and he met Michael when Michael was how old? Not even, not even age, but just, well, you, know, you should know like his age. Young. Yeah, when he was when he was a kid, right? Mm-hmm. When Michael Myers was six year old, he stabbed his sister to death. Mm-hmm. So he when he sees Jamie doing the exact same thing as a as a as a young child, right? Mm-hmm. In a in a pretty and we don't we never find out if Michael um, was seen by Loomis wearing the clown costume, like if he ever wore that around him. Mm-hmm. But he sees Michael's niece that he just spent the entire day trying to protect from from Michael. him. Now doing something that is following in his mm-hmm. footsteps, so you can imagine where that's like traumatic for him and scary and basically PTSD, right? But also it's um it's history repeating itself. Yeah, and it's even worse because there's no, it, you know if you think about it like the reason the first Halloween is supposed to be scary is the idea that a kid who was seemingly normal or as far as we can tell there was nothing wrong with right. Just goes up and just decides to kill his sister. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with Jamie, it's like, here's a little girl we spent the whole movie with. Because remember, we're introduced to Kid Mike only for that first scene, and then we get the adult version. Here's a girl we spent the whole movie with, and now she's killing, as far as we can tell, we find out in the other movies she's alive, but she's killing mm-hmm. her stepmother. And then, you know, it's like, well, hell, to him, this is the same thing repeating itself. This is, this is like, it's, it's all the, I guess... You can tell his relationship with Michael has affected him in like a psychological way, right? Had some kind of deep, long-lasting impact. So would you say that, you know, it's it's even scarier because now he as an even older man has to stop another one of the screwed up members of this family? Mm-hmm. And then you have the thing with him pointing the gun, you know? Yeah. People debate, would he have actually shot her? Mm-hmm. If, if Meeker didn't step in and grab it from him, can you blame him? I mean, you know, he thinks she's a threat. He knows she's a threat because of what she just did. Um, you know, it's just, do, do you really look at Loomis and go, well, now he's a villain when he's only shooting her? Remember, he tried to protect her all day. He's only attempting to shoot her after she's done something irredeemable and evil. And remember, he doesn't know what her intentions are. If she comes down that staircase, she's going to stab the rest of them. Mm-hmm. That's why I always, um, I, and we've been over this before, I was always interested in doing like a like a show, or at least like maybe, if it's not a movie, maybe like a one-off episode or miniseries or something that's just about Jamie and Loomis in between four and five, because there's a lot of stuff there that we don't really know about. So we know that Loomis becomes her psychiatrist when she goes to the, um, the institution. Mm-hmm. We know that they eventually get her out of Michael's possession, but we don't know how long it took. We don't know what she did after the step. Like, I, I'm really shocked that Halloween doesn't have at least maybe a comic that goes over this stuff, you know? It seems like that would be a pretty interesting story to tell. Like, mm-hmm. what, was she evil for a whole night? You know, just, I, I would like to see that. Um, I guess this is a good point to get to get into the, like I said, four, I think, is probably the my favorite performance by Pleasance as Loomis because it just has a cast of characters I really like and he he has like the thing where now he knows what Michael is after mm-hmm. and he also has been through it before mm-hmm. 
And again, he's the only person that comes back from the first two movies, which makes it feel even more like this is his story. Yeah. That's why I've always found so weird. It's like, if you watch Halloween, just like all the movies from when they started to now, it's like, mm-hmm. you're really going to tell me this is about Lori? She vanishes from the series for, for like three films. Mm-hmm. And then only, you know, when she comes back, she gets capped in the start of the next one. So it's just, it's such, it's, I don't know, it's just a weird flex, you know? Um, do you have a favorite scene with Loomis in Halloween 5? You already told me. Uh, I already told you. No, you told me for 4. Oh, in Halloween 5. When he started beating um, Michael with the dang, I think it was the stig one. The 2x4? Yeah. Um, so, again, this is, the, this is the iteration of the character that gets the most criticism. Because they're like, oh, he's screaming at a little girl and he's using her as bait and... You know, just all that crap. And, you know, my, my position has been that his viewpoint was always, and I want you to think about this. You are the psychiatrist of a child who stabbed her stepmother out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. You find out she's possessed by her uncle. You find out she has a psychic connection to him that lets her know where he is. And she won't tell you where he is. Yeah. Are you not going to get upset? It's like I know that people love Jamie, right? And they, but it's like, what what else can you say about like? It's hard to not be on Loomis's side because yeah, he's screaming at her, but he's screaming at her because she she is the only person that can tell him how to stop the demon and where he's at. Yeah, and I mean, you know, another thing is a lot of people are kind of like wimpy because you know parents scream at the kids all the time. You, you'd rather get screamed at than have somebody beat on you, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, getting yelled at. I, I just can't believe that's, that's like actually a thing that, and, I, and you know, it, it irritates me because it's like nobody gets mad that Lori yelled at Tommy and Lindsay, you know, do as I say. Remember in the first movie? Mm-hmm. But hey, you know, with Loomis, I guess he's not allowed to raise his voice. <laughs> it's really crazy. Do, do you remember, um, and this is something you might not have, we've, we noticed it in subsequent rewatches. Remember when he goes to the to the Myers house and he's like talking to what he thinks is Michael, even though Michael's not actually there. And then yeah. he steps away, and then you can see the man in black's foot following behind him. Mm-hmm. And you know that I always thought that was really interesting how the man in black, like, because we we mentioned before that every time you other time you see him in the film, he's never around Loomis specifically. And you would think that at that time he could have attacked him, he could have struck him. But he didn't. He just let him walk around and seemingly, I guess, didn't even bother trying to do anything to him. The other part is that you look at the way the film is uh, structured, right? Where you have um, a lot of people who say that Loomis was like very mean to Jamie. But if you think about it, he's his relationship with her is like very special to those two characters because everyone else kind of downplays her fear. Like when he, when when they call Rachel, she's annoyed that she has to get out the shower and go look around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know when he when he and you even see him beg Tina to stay with Jamie at the at the clinic. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people trash his you know character in this particular film, but I think he's very interesting because he's the only person, as usual, who can stop Michael, mm-hmm. and he's also the only person who actually takes Jamie's. Stuff ser- and you know it, it makes complete sense that he does because look look at what he's seen. He saw Michael get shot over and over and survive that. Yep. He saw Michael get put on fire and survive that. Mm-hmm. He saw Michael possess his niece and to have her stab her his, her stepmother, and survive that, uh, or, or rather be able to do that, you know, mm-hmm. and then find out that he survived getting shot at and you know dynamite blowing him up and so he's seen all kind of crazy stuff happen to Michael and him pull through. So it makes total sense that he would, you know, believe in this. Just like I told you that if I if we ever did a crossover between Halloween and Child's Play, right? And you want and you want to do like the plot, you know, cuz it's usually right Andy is not believed by people that the doll's evil. Mm-hmm. Loomis would believe him in a heartbeat because look at what he's seen. He he believes in supernatural things. Mm-hmm. Um like I, you know, I'm not even trying to do my own fan fiction here, but he's clearly someone that like believes in otherworldly supernatural abilities and powers so if he was in the child's play universe he'd be like oh you have a doll that wants to kill you oh i I can completely buy into that 
you know, he's just, that's why I said he's an interesting character because, uh, especially since when you look at it, like, from the standpoint of this is a protagonist that you've now seen for four movies and you've, like, spent more time with him. You spent more time with Loomis in all of these films except for maybe the first and sixth. Like, you're introduced to Michael first in the, in the original film. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you know, there's a lot of movies where you see the villain before you see the hero. I mean, look at Sonic 2. We just saw that, and you had, you had Eggman as the first person that we see. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's just, that's why I said that it's so much, it's, it's so much more interesting to me to kind of character analyze someone like Loomis or Jamie or Laurie because they actually have a personality, whereas Michael is just guy with knife that doesn't talk. <laughs> you know, like, whatever. Um... Do you do you think Loomis was too mean to Jamie and Not at all. Cuz you have people who actually say he's unlikable. And I'm like, mm. did you watch the damn movie? He's yeah. the only person that is willing to listen to her about her her psychic readings. The doctors, if you remember at the start of the movie, they try to cut open uh mm. give perform a tracheopy. And it's like he tells him, "No, don't do that. She's she's having one of her convulsions and you know, she's going to be done with that soon and then she'll be back to normal." And sure enough, she's back to normal. It's just so sad that people, um, I don't know, it's like they have this warped view of what being mean actually is, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh my God, this man screamed at a little girl who is helping a serial killer by not telling him where she is. <gasps> mm-hmm. Like, what a joke, you know? Um, but just kind of going into that, because I, I, I find that part of their relationship so interesting because he's the only one that, that believes that believes her about this stuff. And is like accommodating. And really, um, you could argue a lot of the film's plot is based around him trying to like find out where Michael is. And also having someone who can tell him where he is, where he is, but won't say it, right? Mm-hmm. And she, you remember Jamie only becomes willing to help him after Tina you know, gets killed. And Lewis goes up and he's like, now are you willing to help me? One of my favorite parts of... Five actually is when after Tina's killed and we get the cops dragging away Jamie, Billy, and Tina's corpse, you have Loomis waving for all these officers, all these different groups of people that can come and help him if Michael actually tries to attack him, just waves all them to leave him alone. And he just stands out there by himself and, and shouts, Michael! go home and I love the part where he says you think if you kill them all it'll make the pain go away mm-hmm. because you have to wonder what is Michael's end game does he, does he really expect that for the rest of his life he's just going to go around killing people and there's you know never going to be an end to this until I guess he just passes away from natural causes just that line on a, a level really gets you yeah but wait a minute when he's streaming Michael go home in the middle of the forest what, wasn't Michael in the forest mm-hmm. at that he time? He was standing yeah. far away. Uh-huh. And we know he was because you can see him all the way in the background. And he, he listens to his, to his advice. He says, you know, go home. I will be there. And she will be there waiting for you. And then he goes back to his house and they're mm-hmm. both there. And what I find interesting is that um, Loomis uses symbolism. So remember, Jamie is sitting in Michael's sister's room judith and she's braiding her hair you know doing the same thing that judith would do when michael would look at her um and michael comes to the house and loomis is convinced michael's coming which is why he locks jamie and that officer that's with her charlie like he threatens the officer with the gun right Mm -hmm. it's like charlie stay with the little girl when he says you know michael's outside Mm -hmm. um and, you know, people will say, oh, he's endangering a kid and using her as bait. But, again, he still cares about Jamie because he's got this officer to protect her. And if he, didn't, he already made a trap for him as well. Right. But he wouldn't tell this officer to stay with her and to the point of threatening the man to stay with her if he didn't care about her. Because he knows that at least there's an adult there that's going to protect her or, you know, give their life for her. Mm-hmm. So he goes downstairs and if you remember, he's walking downstairs and talking to Michael, and Michael just appears behind him in the corner. Mm-hmm. And this is that scene of the two of them talking to each other is, is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting scenes in the whole series. Yeah. And you know why it's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Tell me. What scene? 
the scene of Michael and Loomis talking to each other. Yeah. Why why it's most interesting is because that's the first time where they're talking face to face, I'm pretty sure. Besides when he was little. Well, no, they s- still in a r- kind of did the same thing in four when he offers to give him his life. But it's interesting because he goes up to Michael with no weapon, with no violence. And Michael didn't do anything. Michael just stands there listening to him. And he comes all up close to him. And I'm telling you, throughout the entire series, we've never seen anyone else. It's just Michael just stands by them as they're talking to each other. And it goes back to Loomis's bravery because he's full, he's, he ha- sees Michael with his knife in his hand. He knows what Michael can do. And he doesn't care. He just goes up and talks to him like they're just these old companions. And then he tried grabbing the knife, and that's that's when Michael actually did something. Right, but he also has, the, in this conversation, he talks about how, you know, do you remember how much better you used to be? Because that's a line only Loomis can say to him due to the fact that they've known each other since... For 15 years. Well, remember, at this point, it's 26. Because oh, yeah. it's 15 when the first one takes place at 10, plus 1, because 5 is a year later. Mm-hmm. So... If anyone can say that to him and actually have authority, it's Loomis. Yeah. Um, the other part is that this conversation kind of has a little bit of entrapment because he falsely tells Michael that Jamie is somewhere else. Like, let me take you to her. She can make the pain go away when she's actually upstairs. Mm-hmm. But you have um, Michael, like, cut open his shirt and then, like, slam him into the glass, right? And... Again, these are things a person can survive. And sure enough, you see Loomis, like, yeah, he's bloody at the top, but it still is not really anything that's life-threatening, even though it looked like it looks very violent because it is violent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I've because they don't, they don't have an encounter like this after five, you know, in six, they don't even, in the producer's cut, infamously, they don't even encounter each other. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I try to stress, because um, this topic has been discussed by people before, so by five, you have Michael stabbing Loomis in the stomach yeah. in two, and then in four, throwing him through the glass window, uh, or rather the glass door, excuse me, and then in five, you know, cutting him and hitting him against the wall. Um, he, throughout all these films, yeah, Michael will attack him, but he never tries like, to kill him. Life threatens him. Yeah, he never tries to finish him off. and He just gets him out of the way and gets him, like, hurt for a few seconds. So he can get who he's actually trying to get. And if you notice, he'll only attack him if he po- if Loomis tries to pose a threat to him. Because remember, mm-hmm. in the first one, Michael drives past him without noticing. Um, in the second one, we actually, I don't know if you remember, but we have a point of view shot where it's like what Michael's seeing Loomis and Brackett when, they, for, when, when Loomis is like, this guy, when he's talking to Brackett. Yeah. He doesn't try to attack him then. Um I find it so interesting because in fiction, it's so rare to see a hero that has no problem killing the villain, right? Mm -hmm. But a villain who is very strangely reluctant to kill the hero. Yeah. And remember, Michael does has no, his whole thing, if you watch any of these films, is he doesn't care who he kills. Mm -hmm. He killed, you know, um, all these different people through all these different movies. He has no problem killing Lori, Jamie. You know, just any per- any other important character in the series. But Loomis is the only one where, at least throughout that original film series, there's this reluctance. Mm-hmm. And that makes their relationship a lot more interesting because there's a lot of... Because Michael never talks, you can kind of interpret any way you want. And what do you what do you think is the reason why Michael won't kill him? Because he's known him longer. Than anyone else? Yeah. The one constant throughout his life? Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my whole thing was I believe that he cares about him in his own sick way, but, you know, Michael can't care for someone in like a I you know appreciate you type of manner so him attacking him but never actually doing anything that would kill him is his is like um it's the closest of compassion he can show to somebody yeah you know because and we mentioned this before yeah Loomis um or excuse me yeah Loomis and Michael aren't related but they still have Loomis probably is Michael's closest relationship with anybody like he knew he was separated from his parents after he killed his sister, and then it's like, even in the timelines where Lori survives, like H two thousand eighteen, or at least with H two O, because they're related in that one as well. They only know each other for like what a night, and then another night twenty years later, and then like one more night after that. Yeah. You know, Michael and Loomis saw each other 
every day, damn near probably. You know, we don't we don't know for, but just on a regular basis for 15 years. And when he was, you know, when people are in comas, they can, it's been said they can hear what you're saying to them. So even in that 10 years between two and four, when my, Michael was being checked on, checked up on by Loomis, he probably still heard about him. Mm-hmm. And we know he could hear while he was in the coma because remember when he when they mentioned Jamie, that's what wakes him up and starts the whole events of four. The um, other part of this that's really interesting is that you get the infamous scenes of Jamie trying to escape Michael by herself, right? You know, like just going through the laundry chute and the rest of that. Do you now? You remember you said your favorite scene was when Loomis beats Michael with the two by four. Yeah. But what I think is really interesting is that when we first saw five, you actually seemed to be convinced that Loomis had like betrayed Jamie, and that's the way he tries yeah. to make it appear because he mm-hmm. picks her. He's like, "You want her? Catch the little girl." And it's oh, yeah, say? and she was he was backing up as well. So he so he can lure Michael into that trap, right? Because he has a if he wanted to just give him to give Jamie to him, he would mm-hmm. just hand her over. Um, but he knows Michael has like a one track, and he's known this since Halloween too. Because he gets his eyes shot, I always keep doing just trying to stab, flailing around aimlessly. Mm-hmm. Which is why it's always so interesting to me that people um, have this problem with the fifth film because a lot of stuff in it re- reminds me of like earlier movies. Like, you know how the ending is kind of bad as far as um, the villains win. You know, Michael gets broken out by the Man of Black. Yeah. That's the same type of ending you get with the first movie where Michael gets away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess hey, one gets praised, the other one gets trashed for doing the same thing, pretty much. Um, But that that scene of him beating him with the with the two by four. It's it's an interesting sequence because he hits him with the first. He hits with the tranquilizer gun after putting the hitting him over the over the head with the. um, but the entrapment, right? Mm-hmm. And then when the tranquilizer gets grabbed by Michael and he throws it, then he rips that off the wall and starts to beat him with it until as he's having his heart attack, yeah. he passes out on top of him. Which the imagery of that I've always enjoyed because there's always, like, you know, the problem with a lot of later sequels in this series, the ones that focus on Laurie, yeah. is they try to invoke this idea of, like, they have this very important relationship with each other. And even in like the 2018 time where they're not related, they still try to play it off, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's about Lori. And then they say, oh, no, it's not about Lori. But for some reason, she's still the main character for some reason. Um, But with like with Loomis and Michael, it's so easy to do that because of, again, of how long they've known each other. And the films do a pretty decent job. They're written by different people of like consistently showing that there's something unique about Loomis to Michael. Like, he's not just any other person that he's encountered. He's lasted longer than anybody else, been with him longer than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember, and we talked about this before, the reason Loomis has the the heart attack is because Pleasance got tired of playing the character. He wanted to retire after Halloween 5. He didn't think the character was evolving. So they were going to kill him uh, in 5 when he had that heart attack. Yeah, the heart attack's supposed to be him dying. Yeah, but then they bring him back in six. Right, because what happened was that they were going to include the character of Loomis anyway, and Pleasance didn't want anybody else to play him. So he, so in his at that time ill health, he got up and played him for you know one more one more time. Um, but it's just that that sequence because the thing I really enjoy about Five with this character is it's so interesting to have three characters who are all connected to each other in a way. Mm-hmm. Or I guess, like, every character has some connection to another. Like, you have Tina, who is Jamie's friend, right? That she's become close to over the year of being in a clinic. And then you have Jamie, who is the link to finding Michael. And you have Loomis, who's the only person who recognizes this link and is actively trying to use it to stop him. Yes. And he's, like, uh, you know, he's... A lot of the fans complain about his characterization in that film, but I've, I've never had an issue with it. I thought it was very... Um, like, if I was very serious about catching a serial killer and there's a kid who knows where he is because of her powers you damn right i'm gonna tell her hey you you fork him over mm-hmm. and if i have to yell and scream i'll yell because th- this is very serious this guy killed what 20 something people in like 10 years you know it's I, I i just don't understand people sometimes the stuff they have a problem with and we, we both went over this we both said that halloween five is our second favorite mm-hmm. movie um because there's a lot of parts of it that are just like distinct and I, I i swear to you the performances of both pleasance and harris in that movie 
Pleasance as Loomis, Harris as Jamie, yeah. are two of the best performances in any horror movie, period. I, mm-hmm. I swear that. Because she plays, and we can do a you know a Jamie discussion video if you yeah. want at some other point. But she, she, the way she plays that character of being mute and like suffering internally, you know that's that's all that stuff you just you don't see in your old run of the mill horror movie. You don't have mm-hmm. a character who just even if she can't talk, she's still important to the story. It's still about her, you know. It and it's and same thing with Pleasance. He always every time. Two steps ahead of everybody else as far as performance concerned. He like he completely sells how much with the line that he tells Meeker. Yeah. I prayed that he would burn in hell, but in my heart I knew that hell would not have him. As he's showing him his burned hand from Halloween two. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. So we don't like Halloween six. And why is that? Cause it's trash. First of all, Michael has Jamie's baby. Second of all. <laughs> We have a we have a stalker named Tommy. Third of all, and now they're trying to take Jamie's baby for some reason. I've forgotten. Yeah, it's a pretty confusing plot. In in short, I don't like the film because I don't like the way it treats Jamie. I don't I don't like her being a teen mother. I don't like her being killed off. Yeah. I think that that basically means that Rachel sacrificed herself in four and five for nothing. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't like the explanations it gives for Michael. Like, I'm not a, I just, like, and that's the reason people always say, oh, five caused six to be the way. It's like, no, five introduced a tattoo. You could have said that tattoo was just a thing evil people wore. You didn't have to say there's a cult and Michael's controlled by them and all that stuff. That was all Farron's idea. You know, it's like the man in black didn't have to be this old man that had like one scene in the first movie. He could have, they were going to say at one point it was Michael's brother. You know, like this is all stuff that was written by somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I said before, I do think Loomis's role in the because you saw the producer's cut. Yeah, I think his character is actually probably the best part of the movie. Um, I like that they have him as this retired guy, right? Mm-hmm. Who who just after five stepped away from being involved with that crazy stuff. And then comes back after he hears Jamie on the radio. Right, but he's also contacted by Wynn to come back and replace mm-hmm. him at Smith's Grove. Yeah. Um, he's reluctant to do it because he's moved on, right? He's mm-hmm. finally just put it past him. And the thing I like about Jamie contact, even though I don't, I'm not, I don't like you know Harris not being in it. Uh, it's fake Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> With the thing I like about um, Jamie contacting him over the radio is that. It really plays off the idea. Because remember, the only three characters in all three, I hate saying the word, Thorn Trilogy, four, five, and six films are Michael, Loomis, and Jamie. Mm-hmm. And in four and five, Loomis goes out of his way to protect Jamie. And I, I like the idea that after years of being captive, she still remembers that about him. You know, like he was her protector. He was the, the one, that one person that was always there to make yeah. sure she was safe. But he wasn't there. He was. He wasn't there when she was getting chased in right, six. Right, but yeah, but that's my point that he it's it's something that's out of his control because yeah. he he had no way of knowing where she was. Mm-hmm. Um, to and, con- it, and it usually takes him a while to find where you are and where Michael is. Well, you know how these writers are. If they actually wanted to keep Jamie around, they would have had her last until Loomis could find her, mm-hmm. or they would have had um, someone else step in. I mean. You know, you, you've seen these films. You know that when they want to keep someone around or make sure they're safe, they get another yeah. person involved. Mm-hmm. But just to kind of segue into some stuff, what I find very um, interesting is that after Pleasance passed away, and this was during the time they were making the you know, final, because I told you before that the producers, because it's the one they played for test audiences, and then yeah. they didn't react well to it. Mm-hmm. And that's what caused them to like make the theatrical one where... He has way less screen time. They cut out most of his scenes, mm-hmm. which I think is very rude. It's like this is the this is the only actor that was involved with the first with with all of the first five Michael Myers movies, mm-hmm. and his last one. You're gonna cut out most of his scenes. Yeah, <laughs> That's why I said these. Joe Chappelle is just like a complete joke, and that there's a reason why no one knows him for anything. Um, he was talking about I. He found the character of Loomis born. Are you out of your mind? The only constant wow. in this series besides Michael, and he's so so. The yeah, like it's just nuts. No, it's just, yeah, he's totally boring when he's been used in basically five movies. 
Yeah. Every movie with Michael had him in it. Yeah. And he's actually doing something, getting development. Remember, all of these films were written and directed by different people. Yeah. But the one person they knew they needed and they, they were always going to keep around was Pleasance as Loomis. Mm-hmm. By the way, um, Daniel Farrens, when he wrote the original script for Halloween 6, he actually was going to have Michael kill Loomis. And you know why he didn't do it? Why? Because he found out that Pleasance wanted to keep playing Loomis until Halloween 22. Wow. And that's when he was like, all right, forget this. Mm-hmm. And he claims that when he when he showed Pleasance the script for the original Halloween 6, not the one we got, the original script he had, right? Mm-hmm. That Pleasant said was the best one since the first one. That's the one that had Jamie surviving all the way until the end and like going out in this heroic blaze of glory. Um, and I always felt bad for Ferrance because remember I told you that he wanted to do a movie that had Jamie live until the seventh one. And then at the end when it looked like she's about to be killed, that's when you get Lori to come back and save her daughter. Mm-hmm. That would have been way better than what this... That would have been good. Yeah. Way better than what we got. Well, maybe someday... Other people can make a fan film that, you know, does that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some some person out there. Mm-hmm. Some individual. Literally. Yeah. Who's on the rise. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the other things is that I don't really, I think Tommy's characterization is kind of weird because he's, you know, being creepy. But I do like the idea of bringing him back because it's another character from the first movie just disappeared after that. Yeah. And you remember I told you that what was supposed to happen is... He was going to be the new Loomis, like the new person that's like follows Michael around and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, the problem is if you think about it, that's kind of what they do with Lori in H two O and um, two thousand eighteen, and especially two thousand eighteen, yeah. where it's like, oh, this person he met in the first movie has been affected by her experiences with him, and now she's like a hunter of his. But I've never felt, you know, whether it's Tommy in Halloween six, whether it's Lori in H two O or. or 2018 I've, I've never felt as if those characters work as well as Loomis did because remember this isn't a one night thing this is the guy who knew Michael basically his entire life by the time the first movie takes place you know he's the he was the one constant and the problem with trying to make other characters play the Loomis type role is that they're not written to have any kind of long lasting you know like to where you can believe that Michael has a special relationship with this person because of it's different from all the other ones. Oh, uh, Michael uh, stabbed me ten years ago. Oh, so, uh, yeah. Now I'm his. I'm his hunter, and I am going to give all these speeches about how dangerous he is. Mm-hmm. It's like whatever. Um, to go into my favorite scene with him, and if you notice, because I told you that in the producer's cut, Loomis and Michael don't even meet throughout mm-hmm. the entire film, which is really crazy because you remember he talks to. Um, Deborah Stroh, that's the lady with the glasses at her house. And he gives this good speech about he knew Michael and it just, his ultimate failure, right, to not be able to stop him. And then right after he leaves, she gets killed by Michael. I was like, wait, so did Michael wait for him to leave? Did he know he was there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, just stuff that goes unanswered. Um, one of the other things I really like about his characterization is that there's certain stuff we've never seen him do before that's in this. Like, we've never seen his house before until the yeah. sixth movie. We never see him wear glasses until the sixth movie. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the only one where he's not wearing his iconic, memorable mm-hmm. trench coat. You know, he's got his little gray thing. Um, like sweater. Yeah. And that was really surprised me because you got used to that jacket. I told you in the second and, and fourth one, he doesn't even take it off. He wears jacket the whole movie. Mm-hmm. But I, I just thought it was so interesting how, you know, this character that was around for five movies, you could argue... See, because this is the thing. Hollow, like, Halloween fans may not care that much about Loomis because they don't care about any character that's not Michael a lot of times anyway. But the writers did, which is why no matter who the writer was, they kept him around. No matter who the director was, they kept him around. Um... I just think it's so interesting how you get to this, like, this is the last movie where Pleasant plays him, right, because he's passing. But it's arguably the one that evolves his character the most, because he's retired. He's no longer, like, even if he still believes Michael and Jamie are alive, he's, like, moved on from it that, hey, maybe this won't be revealed until after I pass. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's really, 
there's a lot like again the film i don't think is good but there's a lot of stuff in him that i think could work if it was in a better story you know yeah because the movie's not brought down by pleasant so he, he gives it his usual 100 mm-hmm. percent. it's brought down by taking the main character of the last two movies and making her pop out a kid and throwing her in the trash mm-hmm. and killing her off um bringing back the little boy from the first movie just to have him be a pervert and you know yeah. stop michael with putting stones on the floor <laughs> which makes no sense or beating him with a pipe until he spits out green blood you know just where all that, that stuff was it was it was goofy where did that even come from you know what gets me people that like the sixth movie mm-hmm. you know they like that stuff and then they'll get mad at me for liking the fifth one They're like oh you like the clown cops like you guys like the film where the the su- supposed murderer who has no emotions rapes a little girl yeah like what what is that you know, I mean, I, I just, uh, any any fa- any flaw or fault that five has, six has times a million. Because mm-hmm. like I said, I have no problem with pretending six didn't happen, just being like, all right, it's one, two, four, and five. And then, uh, you know, after that, Michael's never seen again. Maybe the man in black takes him off to get killed somewhere. And then, you know, Jamie and Loomis live happily ever after. You know, I have no problem just pretending that six didn't even occur because again it's not hard to the series especially now the series actively ignores its own sequels Mm -hmm. with each timeline um i'd say the other part that's really interesting is that they have the win relationship so if you notice loomis's first name is sam right yeah but no one ever calls him by his first name in any of these except for wind yeah which is very interesting because remember, Wynn before the sixth movie is only in one scene and mm-hmm. that's in the first one. Yeah. Sam Haddonfield is a hundred miles away, you know, that um and it was it's so it's so by the way, we talk about how Mitch Ryan, his actor who played in the sixth movie, died like a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Which is really sad. I, I still I like the ending of six probably is the one that I, intrigues me the most besides maybe the ending of four. Because and I'm not and I'm not talking about the stupid theatrical cut ending where you see Michael's uh, mask on the floor and then you hear Loomis screaming. That's it was goofy. But I'm talking about the producer's cut one where Loomis goes back into the building, right? And he and he he pulls. He's like, it's all over, it's finished, you know. And then he pulls off Michael's mask and you see Win, and Win's like, Michael's gone, and he grabs him. And what does he say? I forget. It's your game now, uh, Dr. Loomis. Mm-hmm. All the times we repeat it there. Are you kidding me? So the reason that is so interesting to me and he gets the thorn symbol is because I really wanted to see what it would be like for the person who is the most dedicated to stopping Michael to, I guess, now have to take care of him, to now have to be the one yeah. that what, protects what, him. What was going to happen if they continue that timeline? Right. Well, we don't... So the thing about Six, right, is that... When, by the time they even test screen that Pleasant's already passed away. Yeah. So we don't know, like, what we know about Seven, not H2O, but a sequel to Six, was that supposed to take place on the same night, and Michael was going to eventually get out of the Man in Black stuff and back to his regular look, because it's too iconic, right, to not use. I really would have liked to have seen what would, and you know, the thing is, even though we're not, we might, we'll never get a movie that follows that up, Mm-hmm. They still could do a comic if they wanted to. Yeah. You know, everybody keeps saying, do a Thorn movie, do a Thorn movie. Like, yeah, do a Thorn movie, make it animated so we can have Loomis and see what happens with the yeah. the Thorn uh, symbol. Um, I it, guess the... And one thing, I'm, I'm wondering if the um, Thorn logo was on um, Wynn's hand when he grabbed Loomis's arm. Because after like a moment, it just starts to appear on his arm mm-hmm. or like wrist. And he screams uncontrollably. Mm-hmm. Just just so balked at his fate. Um, and that's why it's so hard to look at Six as the final movie in that timeline because it's just such a depressing ending. So Michael is still on the loose. Laurie and Jamie are dead. And Loomis is now, I guess, his person has to take care of him I guess you where it's like really confusing and kind of mm-hmm. depressing because yeah. you know at least with five you could say okay well michael got away with the man in black but jamie is safe or at least she's you know alive indisputably and loomis you know he had a heart attack but people have survived those before mm-hmm. so 
I'll probably just keep going with one, two, four, and five as my like my timeline, you know, and then maybe somebody, some person someday can make a fan film that is has a more happy ending yeah. after after five. Um, and that's what's so sad to me about the character of Loomis because I just wish a character like that had, and this is a problem Halloween has, not just with him but with other characters, where because it's so based around Michael and this villain that that just has to keep coming back no matter how many times he gets killed or whatever. You, you can't give him a happy ending. You can't just have him finally kill Michael. That's it. You know, next time we do a movie, it's a reboot. You, they, they're just, they refuse to do that. And it's really disturbing. But when you think about it, even if Pleasance had lived to, let's say, be in another two or three of those, right? Mm -hmm. They still probably would just kept doing the, the Michael thing because the series is obsessed with that character. And they, you know, they're, they're so afraid to do something that, you know, is removed from him. Which is why Jamie didn't become the killer after four, because they're afraid to, you know, venture into unknown territory. Which we could make a whole video about that too. Just you know, this series and it's like obsession with a, a very, in my opinion, a very bland character who doesn't even really have a personality. He's just a guy with a knife. Like you could, you could put Jason's mask on Michael, and there'd be no difference. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, I I just, I just think Loomis is one of the greatest film characters ever. He's probably my favorite film character. I know he's your second favorite Halloween character after Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, would you have been all right with them making material where it's just Loomis and if it's whether it's Jamie, Laurie, somebody else, and just no Michael, just other villains? Would you be yeah. all right with that? Because mm -hmm. I said before that one of the things I liked about the original movie was that Michael could be anybody. You can just have some person that looked normal and they go out and do something evil. And then, you know, why not have it to where it's a different killer in Haddonfield with the same survivors that keep trying to stop more people from acting crazy. And we would have actually gotten that if, if Halloween 4 had killed off Michael and then, you know, Jamie was a killer in the fifth one. Yeah. Then we would have had, you know, the same protagonist with a new villain. Um, which I'm still, I'm still fine with what we had because I don't think, I think people would hate 5 if they actually did get rid of, you know, Michael because you saw they treat Friday the 13th Part 5 like it's the worst thing ever made, you know, just because they don't use Jason for one movie. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I really uh, appreciate your involvement with this. Um, I didn't want to make this like the Jamie video I did because I don't think Loomis was wasted. I just think that he's a very interesting, even more, like I said before, he's way more interesting to me than Michael yeah. is. Yeah. I'm a Halloween fan because of Pleasance's performance. Because mm -hmm. you, you really don't have a character like this in those other series. You understand that. Mm -hmm. So... I want to thank Stallion for his, his participation. Yep. And those who have listened to this and uh, have a good a good day and thanks for watching. And goodbye guys.